Hey y'all, it's Sarah, the Wine Loving Bookworm, back with another book and wine review for your Sunday. Um, okay, so I just got back from Vermont last week, and that's why I didn't do a review, but I was actually able to knock out two books while I was in Vermont, so I figured I would review both of them quickly for you tonight. Um, but let's start with the wine. Okay, so we went to Smuggler's Notch in Vermont to go skiing, and they had these great wine bottles there, you know, and they're like Smuggler's Notch Reserve, like I'll show you. Um, it's like Smuggler's Notch Reserve, Cabernet Sauvignon, and they had this and they had a Chardonnay. I don't like Chardonnays, so I grabbed this one. So I'm trying to like look it up to be like, what is the deal with this wine and where, are, you know, and I can't find anything on the internet about the winery. And before you say, hey, Vermont doesn't have wineries, yes, they do. And they, um, there's actually, as we were driving to the resort, we saw the grapevines, you know, it's cold, so they were hibernating, is that a word for grapevines? I don't know, but they weren't, you know, obviously producing grapes, but they have vineyards there. So I'm like, why can't I find Smuggler's Notch Reserve wine? Then I flip it over, uh, cellared and bottled in Lodi, California. I mean, come on, so I was real angry about that, and I didn't even, I didn't even bother doing any more um, investigation into it, but we'll try it anyway and see how it is. It's good. It's a very, it's a Cabernet. Like, boom, that's a Cabernet. <laughs> you know, Cabernets are very rich. Let me try it one time. It's good. It's got a little bit of like fruit there at the end. Not good with wine yet. I'm trying, I'm trying to learn. But that's got a little bit of some kind of fruit at the end. Um, but that is pretty good, even though it was made in California. God. I mean, really. Okay, so let's move on to the books I read. The first book I read, oh, it's way over here, sorry. Um, the Girl Who Wrote in Silk by Kelly Estes. This was my book club book. Um, it's fiction. It is about 500 pages, I think. No, not that much. Almost uh, three something. Um, and it, like I said, it was fiction, right? So the author, she grew up in what, rural Washington State, and now she lives in Seattle. That's where the book takes place. Um, she started her career in business with an airplane manufacturer and just was like, this isn't what I want to do, and my real love is writing, and I'm going to write a book. And she did, and it got published, so I guess she's successful. So the summary of the book, there's basically two parallel stories going on. Maylin in the late 1800s and Inara in present day. Maylin and her family were forced out of Seattle. People just were racist jerks and didn't like Chinese people. And they had a business, her father and her grandmother and her, they all ran this business and lived in Seattle. And they made them, pretty much forced them to get on this ship. And they said they were taking them back to China. Well, Maylin overhears on the ship from the captain that they're just going to dump them, like, once they get out of, you know, I don't know much about boating, you know, currents, but once they get out of wherever, you know, the bodies might be dragged back to the beaches, um, they're just going to dump them overboard into the open ocean. She freaks out. She tells her father. Her father makes her, like, go overboard. Um, she's about, gosh, I don't know how old she was, late teens maybe, um, early, early 20s maybe, something around there. She jumps in because she can make it to get to the island. Um, and they're the San Juan Islands, or right off the coast of Seattle, I guess. But they did say that <laughs> later on they had to take a plane. So maybe it's not as close as I think. But anyway, so, so she gets up, she jumps in the water, she kind of passes out, and she wakes up in this guy's cabin, a white guy's cabin, Joseph. Um, so Joseph rescues her, and she tries to begin her life again. Um, and she continues on her grandmother's tradition of embroidering silk. So, you know, the girl who wrote in silk. There it is. Um, so we're going back and forth. And then in present day, in Nara, um, her aunt dies and leaves this house to her. And she wants to make it into a bed and breakfast, much to her father's, you know, just sugar in. Like, he does not want this. He wants her to go and work for a big corporation. Uh, it seems the family is fairly wealthy. So she, um, it, while she's looking through the house, she pulls up this uh, step and she finds a sleeve that has this whole, you know, story of what it turns out to be is the Chinese getting pushed off the boat, you know, written on, uh, 
not written, but embroidered on the sleeve. And it's like amazing. And so it starts her off on this journey of trying to find out who made that sleeve and who used to live in the house. Um, and she also uncovers a really dark, deep secret about her own family through it. Boom, boom, boom. All right, so the main characters were Inara. Daniel is a professor that helps Inara with finding out where the sleeve came from. Inara's father. And then Malin, Joseph, Duncan Campbell, who's kind of their jerk neighbor. Um, Elizabeth, who's J Joseph's sister. Yantao, who is Joseph and Malin's son. My favorite character was Malin. Okay, Kelly Estes is white. I kind of have a problem with white people writing from ethnic perspectives because I just don't think you do it well sorry and even Kelly but I thought she really spent a lot of time on the Malin character she had a lot of depth she did a good job on it so even though this is an uncomfortable situation for me just I don't know it just strikes me wrong I thought she did a great job with Malin but that was really the only one that I really liked everybody else seemed kind of not a lot of depth I did not like the present day stuff they should have just stuck to those things in the past. Um, so I didn't love it. There were so many coincidences, you know, like everything just gets, she finds this like randomly and then this happens randomly, quote unquote, you know, but it all is leading to an ending that she wants. It was just too many coincidences and too many like this is perfect setups. Um, it all came together a, lot, a little unrealistically. The love stories, Malin and Joseph were, a little bit better than Inara and her, like, love interest in the present day. That was super cheesy. Things just, people weren't reacting realistically. They weren't having realistic emotions. Just that whole thing. I, you know, I don't like love stories, but it's okay if it's done correctly or it's done not as the whole story. And these, this wasn't the whole story, but it kind of started overshadowing, especially Inara's, you know, love interest later on. Um, so, two out of five. I would give it really didn't love it it's very easy to read so it's a good traveling book on a plane you know you're just flying through um and it, if you like romance i think you actually might like it okay so now a real quick review of the hot zone um this is by richard preston nonfiction, 411 pages i heard about this on a podcast and it's about the origins of the ebola virus i don't know if it's the origins but it's more like the the first big breakout in um, the 80s, I guess. No, I was a child back then, so I'm not exactly sure. Um, but that's kind of what the book's about. Richard Preston writes for The New Yorker, and he writes books about infectious disease, terrorism, and redwoods. Okay, one of these things are not like the other, right? <laughs> but um, his fascination with Ebola started when he was on a trip to Africa and saw the breakout firsthand. Um, the book served as a very loose basis for the film Outbreak, if you ever saw that name that's in it hey, Kramer versus Kramer wasn't he in Kramer versus Kramer maybe not Dustin Hoffman there it is <laughs> he's he was an outbreak I actually like that movie I like these like disaster movies um he's also Richard Preston was a recreational tree climber so I guess that's where the redwoods come in his brother's also an author so basically this follows the various Ebola threats during the 80s there were um there's actually a scare that I knew nothing about that originated from imported monkeys at a lab near D.C. in Reston, Virginia. I'm like, did you know about that? I had no idea. I was a child at the time. It's in the 80s. But still, I never, never heard about it. And I've, heard, I've read a lot of stuff about Ebola. Um, it also follows the origination of various strains of the virus. So there are many different strains of this virus. The Zaire strain that they talk about is the most deadly, kills 90%. There's like Myinga, I think it's called, which is a little less deadly. The Reston virus killed all the monkeys, but didn't bother the humans, which was like, what? Like They don't know anything about this disease. Let's just put that out on the table. Ebola, they said, is a um, string. Like a lot of viruses are balls, I guess, but this is a string and th they're called filoviruses and they're the worst, they're really bad. And the string has seven proteins on it. They kind of know three of the proteins. The other four they have no idea about. Now, this book was probably written a while ago. I don't know if that's still the case today. But to me, that was, like, mind-blowing. Like, they know nothing about this virus. Um, and it was based – so the story was based on various interviews of the U.S. Army medical researchers. So these are real people in the book. He doesn't change names or anything like that. I learned a lot about reading this by reading this book. 
by the DC incident, how there are different strains, I never knew that, how the virus is different than other viruses, how the strains behave differently in humans, and then like some will kill monkeys. And so, I mean, that's terrifying. I think it mutates like crazy. So that's very terrifying. Um, and how they, you know, really know how little bit, how little they know about the virus itself and how it spreads. They think some strains are airborne, but they're not exactly sure. That's weird. That's, that's scary. Um, it got bogged down in the science from time to time. It was a little too long. He spent large swaths of time focusing on what I consider minor details. I know there was a part at the end where he comes to Africa and he's just really focused on like every blade of grass he sees. And I think that's part of the journalist coming out in him, you know, so that's good for like an article where you can kind of edit it down. But with a book, there was a lot of extraneous information I felt. Um, and yeah, Ebola's scary. Bottom line, it's freaking scary. And you haven't heard about it a lot now. I think they had a breakout like 10 years ago or something, but we haven't heard a lot about it right now. But man, the, just the fact that they can't really figure out the disease is terrifying. Um, so bottom line, three out of five, I would give it. Science nerds, you'll love this. This is like the real life Michael Crichton kind of stuff. Um, so I did enjoy it. I did learn a lot from it. I just thought it was, it was too much in some places. And they didn't have, he didn't have any pictures. He didn't have any graphs. Like that I think would have added to the book a little bit, but you know. All right, so that's my kind of short review of two books. Next week, I'm gonna be reading Little Gods by Meng Jin. Meng Jin, I am doing a lot of Chinese, this is Chinese um, and Asian books lately, not really by, I went on a World War II kick there for a while and now I'm on the Asian books. Um, just happenstance, this was my Harvard book club book. So it was signed by the author yeah, right there, really cool. And you know, obviously this is a Chinese author writing about Chinese people, so that sits with me a little bit better. So um, yeah, I'm a little bit into it. It's I don't know where it's going. I'm about 44 pages in and I, I don't know where it's going, but I'm gonna give it a chance. So, all right, wrap up. The Girl Who Wrote in Silk. Meh, like it's okay. If you like romance stories, very easy to read, pick it up, I didn't love it. In the Hot Zone, I actually think this is a really interesting book. It got boring at points, but man, did it give you a lot of information, at least that I had no idea about with the Ebola virus. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, really pick it up. All right, and then Smuggler's Notch Cabernet. You know, I don't want to like it because it's not from Vermont, and I feel like I got, you know, hoodwinked, but it's not bad. Try it, we're done. It's pretty good. All right, guys, you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday and a great week, and I will see you next week. Cheers.